Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses, and this video is a word to the wise by Manly P. Hall, an article taken from the All Seeing Eye, Volume 5, Number 11, August 1931. A word to the wise. What would you do if a stranger came up to you on the street and after an enthusiastic greeting exclaimed, My dear sir, would you accept the presidency of the International Steel Trust at an initial salary of 10 millions a year? For a moment you might be too paralyzed to think, but even before you could make answer, your mind would have conjured up innumerable doubts and queries. The incongruity of the situation would be apparent. You might even blurt out, but I am not qualified for such a position. I know nothing about the steel business. At a moment such as this, your common sense would come to your rescue. Something inside you would whisper, such things just do not happen. Suppose, however, that this stranger was a dark and mysterious person with soulful eyes and that his proposition was concerned with metaphysical rather than physical things. If he would say to you, my dear sir, I have chosen you among all human creatures to become the possessor of a knowledge which will make you the richest and most powerful person on earth. In fact, there is no mystery of the universe that I am not going to reveal to you in the very imminent future. At a moment like this, would your intelligence sustain you so that you could reason the thing through and say again with a conviction born of common sense, such things just cannot happen. It is very difficult for the average student of occultism to disassociate philosophy from miracles, and nothing short of a miracle of the first order would make the average metaphysician as good as he thinks he is. Nearly all students of spiritual subjects are striving for what they term illumination. They have no idea whatever as to what the word means, but sense that it is in some way associated with great return for small effort. Illumination is the point where work and travail end and the individual is supported forever on the universal bounty. While the desirability of perfection is evident, the probability of it is exceedingly remote. The interval between the average individual and the summum bonum is indeed a yawning gulf. It is very tragic to see people cultivating the idea that they are within jumping distance of perfection when, in reality, it will take at least three jumps before they will reach common sense. Conceit greatly complicates human life and must inevitably result in discouragement and loss of motion. We nearly all believe that we are spiritually successful, even though most of us are physical failures. We cherish the fond hope that our divinity may draw upon us at almost any moment. Some of us are foolish enough to spend a lifetime waiting for it to happen, and that is very foolish. Others, after what they regard to be a sufficient period of probationship, start out to make things happen. In other words, if illumination does not descend upon them, they go after it with a gun. Of course, there is always a little problem as to just where to look for it, but then there is always someone with a helpful suggestion. Others who have not found it either are always ready to point out the way. Our mystics have received an old game. It is no longer. Who has the thimble? It is. Who has the illumination? Where did they get it and how much did it cost? It is very easy to prove something to an individual who already wants to believe it. So it requires very little persuasion to convince metaphysicians generally that the moment of their enlightenment is at hand. At this point enter the pseudo-gurus, near initiates and perhaps adepts who find it very profitable to tell very foolish people what they want to hear. Our modern occultists are just reeking with advancement, and it is a joy to hear what they were in their last incarnation. There is scarcely an important person in history who is not now incarnated in someone of no importance whatever, except to himself. The modern avatars of Plato, Pythagoras, Bema, Swedenborg, and Hypatia, to say nothing of the incarnations of Christ, the disciples, apostles, and all the saints, are not, for the most part, 
an inspiring lot. These persons are well-meaning and they get a certain pleasure out of imagining themselves to be something in particular. The problem lies in the fact that after they have played out greatness for a little while, they forget they are playing and take the role seriously. All men naturally desire to know and also to achieve and this desire is perfectly normal. But unless common sense is employed in spiritual problems, tragedy is inevitable. Just because we desire a thing is no proof that we are entitled to it. If we would be absolutely honest with ourselves, we would realize just how little we are fitted for the high positions which we would hold. A wise man always takes a low seat, while a foolish man takes a high seat and has to be put down. While on this subject, we should analyze the substance of perfection. What does the average person regard as the privileges which perfection bestows? A sort of straw vote on the subject produces the following. People who are perfect do not have to work and cannot be contradicted. They may also do just as they please, regardless of how it affects others. And a genii is appointed to each one to ensure that his slightest whim becomes a cosmic law. Of course, people do not explain it just that way. But when the subject is all summed up, it means just this. Probably this is the reason why the advanced occultist hates work. He is terrified by the thought of those menial pursuits by which the less enlightened must ensure their survival. Spiritual people, full of consciousness, realization, and perfection, have many most annoying peculiarities. One of them is their delightful naive, little way of grabbing everything they can get their hands on, on the grounds that they are being fed as with heavenly manna. We know one person is full of spirit or something that he affirmed it to be a genuine privilege out of heaven to permit him to owe you money. Furthermore, being full of the Holy Ghost, he had absolutely no intention of paying. God's abundance took care of him at your expense. Then there is that kindly soul so full of illumination that he can no longer defile himself by supporting his family. So he removed his shoes, cut off his pants at the knees, let his whiskers grow, and went forth to share his ignorance with the rest of the world. Nor should we forget that highly illumined woman who prayed that the infinite good would bestow congenial employment upon her. She refused position after position because they did not quite come up to her consciousness. We finally discover that her ideal of God-given employment was to be paid very well for doing absolutely nothing with double wages for overtime. Why do spiritual people always live off the efforts of just ordinary folk? One person on the very verge of cosmic consciousness once told me that he would work, only that it distributed his vibration so. This same individual, however, does not seem to be perturbed over the vibrations of friends and relatives who have to support him. Nearly all religious people have a disregard for money, and yet most of them will take any that they can get their hands on without effort. The peace and power motto is incomplete without the plenty tacked on the end. The facts are simply these. The average individual's spiritual development is of such a comparatively low order that nearly all of his higher aspirations are concerned with the comforting of his physical state. There is a precedent throughout history for the auto holy living of the industrious profane. The farmers and the merchants of every century have sweated their lives out supplying a rich clergy with the best of everything. But people that feel that they are spiritual also feel that they are entitled to the fat of the land, that they should be supported and petted simply because of the privilege which their presence bestows. The purpose of occultism in the first place is not to make a man divine, but to make him human. Every occultist feels that if he does not get out of his body, after the sixth lesson, he should have his money back. People work to see auras or to deliver some kind of half mediastic clairvoyancy or try in some way or another to breathe, meditate, or pray their way out of their ordinary human responsibilities. 
phenomena are not the things which either philosophy or occultism are primarily concerned with. The first purpose is to increase the merit and integrity of life, the directionalization of action to intelligent and constructive ends is the only important thing in life. Without this, all else must fail. There is nothing more incongruous than to hear petty people talk about big cosmic realities. We all desire to possess occult powers, and we will work for them. That is, if we do not have to work hard. But very few people are willing to struggle along through the years developing poise, charity, kindliness, truthfulness, and generosity. These homely virtues are beneath the dignity of those old souls, yet no one can be truly great without the homely virtues. No one can ever go higher than his lowest thought or be broader than his narrowest point. He cannot shuffle off his temperament and don virtues that are not his own. Our so-called spiritual people just do not know what spirituality is, for they cannot know what they are not. They get spiritual success, which is simply self-control, mixed up with physical success, which is possession. They get spiritual wealth, which is wisdom, confused with physical wealth, real estate, and bonds. They get spiritual peace, which is the realization of responsibility, well met, mixed up with physical peace, which is immunity from bill collectors and nagging relatives. As long as spiritual qualities are confused with physical qualities, the development has not gone very far. But a person will say, if I attain to the spirit, will not all these other things be added unto me? The answer is very evident. Jesus, who is regarded as one of the world's few perfect men, had no place to lay his head, and Buddha, another of the world's immortals, had no garment but a shroud borrowed from a graveyard. The riches of the wise are not of this world, for we can have all other things added unto us and still not be rich here because material qualities are so illusionary that they are not regarded as valuable enough even to be classified. Physical things are nothing in eternity, but to little minds dwelling in time, they are the one reality. The current play, Green Pastors, is not very far from the average person's conception of reality when it depicts heaven as a fish fry. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.